Paul would say to the church at Ephesus, be ye unwise. Isn't that interesting? But understand what the will of the Lord is. My. When I read this, I realize that the Apostle Paul has given some instructions to us and showing us how important it is to understand God's will. Now, the only way we're going to really understand God's will is, of course, to study God's will. We, we, under, we know that. But also, this truly and fully and firmly affirms the clear warning that Jesus gives to all. Matthew chapter 7, as was read a moment ago, verses 21 through 23. Listen to it again. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? The answer that they're going to get from Jesus is exactly what he says. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Those are horrifying words to me. And so it's very important that we do the will of God. Jesus said, thy will be done and not mine. I was thinking this evening as I was sitting and uh, someone came to my door and I visited with him a little while. And I sat back down and as I was sitting in my recliner and just sort of easing my mind and I thought, I wonder, what would it be like if everybody came back tonight that was here this morning? I knew that they wouldn't. And you might be saying, well, uh, you, what do you mean? Well, because of a pattern that you see. Can we honestly say that they're doing the will of God when in Hebrews we're told not to forsake willfully the assembly? Can we truly say they're doing the will of God when Jesus tells us to put the kingdom first in Matthew 6? I don't say this to be cruel, but can we truly say that they're doing the will of God? Some perhaps could not be here. Some could. There is no doubt in my mind. And so we need to understand the affirmation that Jesus gave in this clear warning. Not everyone's going to make it to heaven. Only those that do the will of God will be the ones that will make it. Now, knowing is very important, and doing uh, the will of God is so vital to each and every one of us. Many people know but do not do, and that's unfortunate. Yes, we must know, but we must do what we know. And when we do this, then we are simply fulfilling our Christian service, and this truly involves doing the will of God. I don't want anyone to be able to say to me, well, why didn't you mention that to me? Why didn't you say that we, and I, I've said it for years and years and years. I, I think one of the hardest things for a gospel preacher to do is to try to, as he works up his sermons, to try to, not to change the word at all, but try to come to, with another approach and see if we can sort of ring a bell in people's ears but more than anything else, touch their hearts. But when I think about this, thy will be done, Jesus yielded in obedience to God's will. There's no one on earth ever suffered as much as he did. It's amazing to me how people will say, well, I had a headache Sunday night, or I had a stomach ache, or I had this, or I had that, but, you know, they'll go to work with the same headache and the same stomach ache and all this and that, and... I know you probably think I'm being pretty cruel, but I'm not. I'm being honest. Amen. I know that Jesus did things when he didn't feel like it. Can you imagine Jesus going to the cross, carrying his own cross, carrying his own burden, and he fell under that cross? What was it due to? It was due to the beatings, the scornings that he went through. But still yet, he yielded in obedience. And so I read in Philippians it's an interesting verses here in chapter 2. I want to read these verses. Who, being in the form of God, being this is talking about Jesus, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, 
and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at that name uh, of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those are powerful verses. When you think about what he says here, do we not appreciate what Jesus has done? Oh, I believe everybody in this room does. I'm not questioning anybody here. But I am questioning the church as a whole. I really am. And so we look at these verses and then look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and the verses 9. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Now he's talking about spirituality here, we know. But sometimes we fail to understand what Jesus really has done for us. Or either we have decided what Jesus has done for us really doesn't mean that much to us. That's just that simple. And so therefore we find ourselves that uh, uh, the benefit that we gain from His obedience and yielding in obedience doesn't really mean that much to us. That breaks my heart. That really troubles me. And, it, and I, I fear for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are not doing the will of God. Jesus instructs us to yield in obedience to God's will and not ours. That's very important. Because we find that in John 4, 24, that God is spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So, you know, we see this, how important it is to worship God. Well, I was there this morning, okay, where were you Sunday night? Where were you Wednesday night? Where will you be when the gospel meetings come? When, when, and all of these kinds of things. Now believe me, there's legitimate reasons for some not to be here tonight. There really are. But no excuse will work. And that's important to know. I think about, I look back there, I don't see Coy tonight. I know why Coy's not here. Do you think Coy just said, oh, I don't want to go back tonight? Or Virginia, you know what? If they could, they'd be right there sitting by that grandson of theirs who is so faithful because they love God. They love the church. And that's something for us to think about. In John 5, 19, here's Jesus would answer these people. And he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself. I said that this morning. We can do nothing by ourselves. It is God who does everything for us. That is, gives us the power to do this, the power to do that. We speak, we walk, we do everything by, by God's power. He says, I can do nothing of myself, but he that sent the, I mean, excuse me, but he that sent the Father do. Now, keep about the thought of this. For what things soever he doeth, these also do it the Son likewise. Have you ever heard the statement, like Father, like Son? That's something about what he's saying. Now I think about this. God's our Father. I wonder how many of us could say like Father, like Son. Or like Father, like Daughter. We are the sons and daughters of God. And we are to do His will. And if we refuse to do that, then <clears throat> our souls are in jeopardy. In John 5.30, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will. There it is. But the will of the Father which hath sent me. That was the life of Jesus. His whole life was to be committed to his Father, to do his will, to please him to bring honor and glory to Him. We look in John chapter 6 and verse 38. Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do my will, not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. 
Jesus declared to the whole world, I didn't come to do my will. And brethren, if we're here just to do our will, then it's like I said this morning, it is our self-will. It's our self-service. It's all about me and what I want or don't want. I'll go if I want to go. I won't go if I don't want to go. I, I just won't do it. I, I'll study if I want to. I won't study if I don't want to. I'll pray if I want to. I won't pray if I don't want to. We get that kind of haughty spirit about us, and then we become extremely rebellious when it comes to doing the will of God. It's a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing. But I will say this, and I say it with an, a strong affirmation. Anyone who loves God will do their very best to do His will. I really appreciated the prayer. We all face temptation. And the only way we're going to get past that temptation or through that temptation, we know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. We know what he said, that God will provide a way. But we have to love God with all of, all of our being, heart, mind, soul, strength. That's part of it. And so it's important that we understand as we look at Jesus, who is our example, who set the pattern for us, that we're to do the will of God as he did. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, the Hebrew writer says this about Jesus, though, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. How? By the things which he suffered. Hmm. And being made perfect, and the word perfect here means absolutely perfect, flawless. In being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Now listen to this, unto all them that obey him. There is no way to misunderstand this. No way. And so it's that important. Several years ago when I was, well, I think I was in uh, starting my second year in Brown Trail, it was 19, whenever, uh, I think 89, 90, or somewhere in that neighborhood. And I, I remember on a congregation that was supporting me would have me to teach Bible class. And it just so happened that we were in the book of Hebrews. It was on a Sunday morning. And the two of the elders out of four of them was it, were in my class. And they said, be sure and express to this congregation the importance of attending all the services. And how that if they forsake the assembly willfully, then they have sinned. I have no problem doing that because, you know, I, I love them. I want them to go to heaven just like I want to go to heaven. But there was a man there and he said, let me tell you something right now. After services, he came to me and he was very, very, very haughty. He said, because of what you said this morning, I'll never attend a Sunday night and a Wednesday night service. And I really wanted to say this. Well, it'd be something new if you did. Because he never, as long as I was there, ever came back on a Sunday night or a Wednesday evening. The only thing I said to him was, brother, you're telling God that, not me. Amen. I'm only the messenger. I'm not the message. Amen. Well, about two weeks later, he came forward. He came forward with tears in his eyes. And he couldn't even express his repentance he finally just put his arms around me and said, Brother Young, just tell him what I'm trying to say. And as far as I know, the man has never missed a service since then. He said, I just really want to do God's will. I won't, because he is the author and the finisher of my salvation, I want to do his will. And that was an extremely, extremely precious time. Sometimes we take things personal when a preacher will speak. And we'll turn on the preacher and become vindictive toward him. But always remember this. He's simply the messenger. You know, God will tell Moses, they're not mad at you. They're not upset with you, Moses. They're upset with me. Yes, you're my messenger because you give them my message. Yes, he is indeed the author of of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. I cannot overemphasize that. Then I think about Matthew chapter 26 where Jesus speaks and He says, then, I mean, John, Matthew speaks and then says, Then cometh Jesus 
with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his, the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. In other words, he said, I am hurting so much. My soul is hurting so much, it's, it's like I'm going to die any moment. Amen. And that's so sad. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Can you imagine? No. Not a single solitary one of us can imagine the agony that Jesus was in at that moment. He knew what he was facing. He knew that he was going to take on a death that no one would ever understand. But he knew that was the way it had to be done. Thy will be done. When we see the desire and success of Jesus, our only Lord and our only Savior, when we see all of this in doing the will of God, then surely we begin to learn how we too can be obedient to the will of God. Oh, but He was Jesus. Yes, He was. But He was just as human as I am and you are. He felt the very same pain that you would feel. Identical pain. Because He was God in the flesh. Do we not understand why all of this took place? Do we not realize that God sent His Son to do all of this, to carry Him through all of this, so that we too could do the will of God? He set that example for us. We are all, if you've heard me say it many times, we're all example setters. And our examples are powerful, whether they're examples of bad or good. They're powerful and they're influential. But we need to understand now that Jesus yielded in obedience to God's will and we can do no less. But also, there's some vital truths about the characteristics of obedience. There will be a love for and an understanding, an understanding of God's will when we are obedient. I want to know what God wants me to know. I'm a little bit curious, but more than that, I know that someday all of this is going to face me, John 12, 48. But also I love God. And I want to love Him as God wants me to love Him. I don't want to disrespect God. I don't want to be disobedient to my Father. I want to prove to Him that I care for Him. I want other people to see Christ in my life. How would you feel if I became unfaithful? And you know what being unfaithful is. It isn't just necessarily going out here and killing somebody. There's a lot of things we... Just not putting the kingdom first means I'm unfaithful. What would you, would you encourage the elders here to keep me? Of course you wouldn't. Got to get rid of him. He's not faithful. But we don't even consider ourselves. Of course, if I'm not faithful, they either I must repent or they need to tell me to move on. But first of all, I need to repent. That's what's important. It is important at all that I stand up here and preach. Someone, you know, I could kill over right now and Joe could come up here and finish this sermon. That's not a concern. If I'm not here, someone will be in this pulpit. I am not the preacher here at Nettleton. I'm a gospel preacher for the Lord's church. Now, I love my work here. I love this congregation. But this congregation doesn't survive because of Jimmy Young. We survive because of all of us together. Our strength is not from me. Our strength is from all of us together. And when we find our weaknesses, it's because there's a weak link in the wheel, 
And we don't seem to understand that just one, one weak person weakens the whole chain. That's how vital we are. That's how effective or ineffective we are. But we need to know these truths about the characteristics of obedience because if there is a love and that love has to be there, then we'll have an understanding of God's will. Remember when Philip <clears throat> and the eunuch were together there in chapter 8 of, of Acts? When the scripture says, beginning with verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth, now listen to this, and began at the same scripture. Do you remember where the eunuch was at in scripture? Do you remember? Was he in the book of John? No, John had never been written. Was he in Matthew? Never been written. Where was he at? He was in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And he wanted to know, who is this man that, 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 that's been written about here? But he started right there and preached unto him who? Jesus. He was telling him, this is the man Jesus. This is the Messiah. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? You know the rest of it. He had to confess that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and he did that. Why did the eunuch obey the gospel? Why? Because he had a love and an understanding of the will of God. And he wanted to be a child of God and a servant of God. But not only will there be a love for an understanding, there will be a recognition of one's own sinfulness. And guess what that will bring about? Repentance. When someone is sorrowful, they will repent. You know, when Paul had written to the church at Corinth, he said, godly sorrow brings forth repentance. But it has to be godly sorrow. And it's godly sorrow because of our love and an understanding of God's will. And because of that, we recognize our sins and we desire to do nothing less than to repent. That's why we have verses like Romans chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. When we have these verses and we have these understandings, then we have a tremendous, a tremendous character about us. Know you not? This is what Paul said in Romans 6. That so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into His death. That's what's known as a rhetorical question. They knew the answer to that. Yes, we know that. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of His death. Are we getting this? Oh, I hope so. Then he continues. We shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve him. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Yeah, that recognition will be there. And we truly will repent. But also, with this love and this understanding and recognition, there will absolutely be a willingness. A willingness for us. And that is so important also. Because that willingness it will bring us to submit to God. A submission to God. And to be faithful to Him. And to follow His commandments in obedience. And some would call it demands. Well, God does demand. He demands through command. It's just that simple. There's nothing about this that's complicated. I think about again in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I'm telling you, the preaching on that first day of Pentecost touched their hearts, at least 3,000 souls. There might have been 3,000 more there that didn't. I don't know, but we know there was 3,000. And they began to cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Pretty simple, but it takes a willingness. But you know, I still love John 14, 15. 
Jesus made it so clear. Probably the youngest child in this room right now will understand what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. Just that simple, isn't it? Wonderful words. I think about Naaman in 2 Kings 5. Oh, he just couldn't understand. Why would I have to go down in this old dirty Jordan and dip myself seven times? But when he came to a willingness, when he did what he was required to do, what he was commanded to do, guess what? When he came up that seventh time, he was pure as a driven snow. Why? Because he obeyed the commandments of God. And that's very important. And it's so important for each of us. It's so important that we develop a strong Christian character. And we have to do this in order to resist temptation. And a moment ago I had mentioned Hebrew, I mean 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, where Paul said, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. Some people think that their temptation is unique, but it isn't. There, there's nothing unique about my temptation or yours. It's common to all men. We're all tempted to do certain things, to say certain things, to think certain ways. It's there. And so he says, this is common. But now listen to this. And here's where it's encouraging. But God is faithful. Absolutely he is who will not suffer you to be attempted above that you are able. But now listen to this. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. I believe that, don't you? And anyone who is willing and develops this love and understanding and recognition, they will have a strong character. And in that character they will say, I am going to do the will of God. Not my will, but God's. Thy will be done is what we'll be saying. And so this evening as we close this out, true Christian living, or you could say true Christian service, is always characterized by doing what God requires of each and every one of us. Always. It isn't just some of the time or part of the time, or if we want to do it or don't want to do it, no, for a faithful child of God, it is their character. It is their Christian duty, and they know it to be living and serving the way God would have them to. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God? You know, some people try to excuse or make excuses for others who sin. Don't ever do that. Don't do that. Not only are you doing an, in, an injustice to them, but you're doing an injustice before God. God knows their heart. <clears throat> you just don't do that. And so he says, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? Don't do that. My, my, no man's going to stand with you or for you on the day of judgment. We're each going to stand alone. We're going to give an account for ourselves. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Absolutely. These are serious, serious scriptures. And so therefore we need to understand that if we're truly Christians, we'll be doing all that God requires of us to the best of our ability. You see, obedience, it really is the result of one's desire to do God's will. Why? Because they love God. They are grateful, and they're going to do God's will more than their own will. <clears throat> They'll do it. Don't ever forget Matthew 7.20. <clears throat> and it's rarely that I'll do a sermon without leaving Matthew 7.20 out. Somewhere I'm going to inject it normally. Because sometimes <clears throat> we think we're fooling people. No, you're not. Mm -mm. You really aren't fooling anyone. You know, Paul tells the church at Corinth, we're like an open book. We're read among all men. They see us. We're like a book that they're reading. Yeah, Matthew seven twenty. Jesus said, you'll know them. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Do we not get that? Unfortunately, some do not. 
But also, let us not forget Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. Don't forget that. Am I trying to persuade men or God? Am I trying to please men or am I trying to please God? If I'm trying to please man, then I should not be the servant of Christ. As a matter of fact, the strong end of that is, if I am not trying to please God, then I cannot, cannot be a servant of Christ. That's an impossibility. Why? Because as I said this morning, you cannot serve two masters. For either we'll love the one and hate the other. The word hate there means to love less. Same language, same Greek root word, to love less. Meaning, just like Jesus said, you can't love your mother, father, brother, sister more than me. Can't do that. You have to hate them. That is love less. I can understand that. I can see why I should not love my wife or my son more than I love God or my daughter-in-law. I can see why I cannot love you more than I love God. I understand that. That's as simple-minded as I am. You see, God has to be first. We need to ask ourselves, though, am I truly obedient? Can we truly say to God, your will be done and not mine? Can we do that? For some in the church, they can't. And for some in the church, unfortunately, due to what I see, some will never repent. They will go to their graves being rebellious toward God at all the time saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. No. If we love Him, we obey Him. Can each of us truly say, Lord, Thy will be done. That's how important it is. Thy will be done. You know what God's will is? <clears throat> His will is, is what Peter said, that God is not willing that any should perish. That's not what God's will is. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. And that's why He sent His Son, so that they would not be lost. God will no longer wink at ignorance, Acts 10, 34, I think it is. But He commands all men everywhere now to come to repentance. You know what? We have something here that is absolutely priceless. This is God's will. Not only is it His will, it's His law. And Jesus said in John 12, 48, these words will judge you. That's serious stuff, brethren. But how many of us can truly say, Thy will be done and not mine? God's will is if you're not a Christian to obey the gospel. That's why Jesus said that if you, you're to hear His words and there in John 5, 24. But also in John 8, 24, He says, Except you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. These are the words of Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus also said in Luke 13, 3, Except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. That's the, from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, If you'll confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. But the very next verse says, If you deny me before men, then I will deny you before my Father. Makes sense to me. But Jesus, the Master Teacher, the Savior of the world, said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not be condemned. They're lost. That's what the scriptures teach. I say this out of love. I want to see, just like God does, everybody saved. Because you know what? My soul is no more precious than anyone else's. God doesn't love my soul more than he loves the lost. I just thank God he let me live long enough to be a Christian. We need to understand these things. For those of us that are Christians, we need to understand this. We truly need to understand this. God doesn't want us to be lost. He wants us to be faithful even unto death, Revelation 2.10. And if we're not seeking first the kingdom of God, then we're lost. As I stated this morning, just being lukewarm will not get it. You can be lukewarm and satisfied with just being lukewarm. But on the day of judgment, just as read from Scripture, Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. Is he fair? You better believe he's fair. He's just and he's right. You see, our pride, as I mentioned this morning, 
And just outright rebellion will keep some in the church from going to heaven. Amen. Isn't that sad? When all we have to do through love and through our willingness and our obedience is to say, as the two said this morning, I have sinned. I seek forgiveness. And James tells us in James chapter 5, I believe it's verse 17, he tells us that we're to confess our faults one to another. We're to pray one for another. For the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Thy will be done. Can you say that? Will you do that? That is, do the will of God. Not just on Sunday morning, not just on Sunday evening, not just on Wednesday evenings, not just during a vacation Bible school or gospel meetings or any other time, but every day of our lives will we put the kingdom first. Will we do what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Brethren, we'll never get to heaven if we do not let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. I glorify God, you glorify God, we glorify God through our lives. Where do you stand?